Hello, I'm Bruce Rusk from the University of British Columbia. This video is the second of a series introducing key concepts about data collection for From the Ground Up, Buddhism and East Asian Religions, a research project sponsored by a partnership grant from the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada and based at the University of British Columbia. For more about the project, visit our website at frogbear.org. In this video, I'll be offering a couple of recommendations on camera equipment and how to set it up. This won't be a tutorial about all the basics of photography, but I'll be offering a few tips about techniques that are useful for the kind of photography we'll be doing for the Frogbear project, especially photos destined for an open access online repository. First, it's entirely possible to take good and useful photos with any recent camera, including the one on a smartphone. But there are several advantages to a standalone camera, especially a removable lens camera like this digital SLR. For one thing, all else being equal, the quality of the images will be higher. More importantly, you can control more of the settings of the camera to get the final results you're seeking. For example, you have control over the depth of field, which refers to the range of distances that will be in focus in the photograph. A shot of a landscape might include some elements that are close to the camera and some that are quite far away. If the depth of field is narrow, only a small range of distances will be in focus, either things that are close to the camera or things that are further, but not both. But for documentary purposes, where we are trying to give viewers as much detail as possible, that's undesirable. We want as much as possible to be in focus. We control how much of a photo is in focus by setting the camera's aperture. That means that we're setting how wide the opening that lets light into the camera will be, something like the pupil in your eye. The smaller the opening, the more of the image will be in focus. To achieve this, we set the aperture on the camera higher. This is usually indicated with an f-stop, the letter f followed by a number. The higher the number is, the greater the depth of field, and the more of the image will be in focus. On a camera with manual controls like this one, we should set the aperture to a value of at least f8 or higher for shots like this. Some cameras will also offer shortcut modes like landscape, sports, and portrait. The landscape mode will try to pick a setting that ensures a high depth of field. This is a good choice for documentary purposes. Although a high depth of field ensures that more is in focus, there's also a drawback. A smaller aperture means that less light is getting into the camera, so the shutter has to stay open for longer to capture an image. How long it takes, the duration of the exposure, depends on the light conditions. In bright sunlight, the shutter only needs to be open for a tiny fraction of a second, but if it's dimmer, in the evening or under cloudy skies, the shutter will have to be open for longer. That introduces another potential problem. The longer the exposure, the harder it is to keep the camera completely still the whole time, and if the camera moves during the shot, the photo will be blurry. We've all had pictures ruined because the camera wasn't steady, especially when the photo was taken in dark conditions. Blurry photos are obviously not useful for research purposes, so how can we prevent them? The first step is to stabilize the camera. The most effective way to do that is with a sturdy tripod. A good tripod will keep the camera from moving as long as it's on a stable surface and there aren't other sources of motion, like wind. A tall tripod gives you more flexibility and positioning, but for stability, it's preferable to keep it as low as possible. Most tripods have a column that extends upward, but the higher it goes, the more the camera will wobble. So it's better to get height through the legs rather than the neck. And many tripods have a hook on the bottom of the center column. You can use this to hang something heavy like your camera bag. The extra weight will make the tripod even more stable. When the camera is on the tripod, you can set up your shot precisely by looking through the viewfinder or at the screen. Make sure it's level and that it's seeing what you want, and then click. But if you have clumsy fingers like me, you're likely going to add more shake to the camera when you press the shutter button. Even if you press very carefully, you can jiggle the camera enough to ruin a photo. So ideally, you can use a remote shutter release, like this one. They're available for a low cost and well worth it. 
Another option is to put the camera on self-timer mode. You press the button and the camera waits a few seconds to trigger the shutter. A further advantage of shooting with a tripod is that you can take multiple shots from the same point of view. For example, you can try photos with different camera settings, such as different apertures and shutter speeds. And later you can go back over your photos and pick the one that came out best. And if you're in a crowded place, you could wait for a moment when there are no people in the frame. Finally, a tripod is useful for shooting panoramas. You can take a series of overlapping shots from one point, rotating through the full 360 degrees, and they'll all be nicely lined up. You can view these files as a group, and there are various software tools available to stitch the photos together into a single file. Either the individual files or the panorama output can be included in our repository. Another way of ensuring sharp pictures is to reduce the time of the exposure. The less time the shutter is open, the less likely it is the camera movement will create blur. This is especially important for handheld shots. One way to keep exposure times short is to increase the amount of light. The darker the conditions are, the longer the shutter has to remain open to gather enough information to create an image. And conversely, the brighter the conditions are, the more quickly a shot can happen. Of course, if there's plenty of natural light, the sun will do the job for you. But if there isn't enough light, or it isn't illuminating the things you want to photograph, you might need to bring your own. That's where a flash is extremely useful. It's helpful for illuminating objects that are close or at a medium distance, up to a few meters away. This may be counterintuitive, but it's also useful when there's too much light. If you're trying to take a picture of something relatively dark, like the interior of a building, when there's lots of ambient light, it can be hard to see much detail in the dark areas. This can happen when you're photographing something with the sky in the background, for example. The flash can bring the dark areas closer to the same light level so that the subject of the photo doesn't disappear into the shadows. Many cameras, including cell phones, have small built-in flashes, but these usually have very limited power. Larger flashes, like this one, produce far more light and can usually be controlled more precisely. But they're most useful for the kind of documentation work we'll be doing in the Frog Bear project when you can not only adjust the amount of light, but also control where it's coming from. They let you illuminate your subject from another angle, not straight from the camera. This is especially valuable when photographing three-dimensional objects, and if you're trying to show details of textures on their surface. Light coming straight onto the surface can flatten out all the variation, but light coming from the side helps bring out those features. One important case is stone inscriptions as discussed in our video on photographing epigraphy. A remote flash can be mounted on a light stand like this. But if you have enough people on the team, you might find it's quicker and more flexible simply to have someone hold the light by hand and try out different positions. Sometimes even a small change in the position or the setting can make a big difference in the final result. So it's a good idea to try out a few shots to see what works best. Another factor you can control on the camera is the sensitivity, how much light the camera sensor will require to create the image. This is usually expressed through the ISO number, a value that's usually in a, in a range starting at 100 or 200 and going up from there. The higher the ISO, the less light the camera needs to capture the image, so the shorter the exposure can be. But there's a downside to a high ISO. The camera makes the image with more incomplete data, so the photo will tend to be grainy or smeared, especially in dark areas. For high quality images, the ISO should ideally be in the 100 to 200 range, and usually not above 400. A final setting that you can control on your camera is the file format. Most standalone cameras and some cell phones will let you take pictures in RAW format which means that the camera stores all the uncompressed data that the sensor captures. These files are bigger than the ones in the more common JPEG format because JPEG files are compressed and some of the original image data is lost. But they preserve much more information than JPEGs. Raw photos add an additional layer of complication because they require further processing to be viewed on a computer or printed. 
you can think of raw files as comparable to film negatives, which need to be processed to produce a print. Similarly, raw files need to be converted to another format to be usable. The best format to convert them to is TIFF, an archival format that keeps all the image data. TIFF is the best format for long-term archiving and the preferred format for the FrogBear repository. There are various programs that can convert raw files to TIFF. Often, such a program is provided with your camera. There's also free open source software that can do this. If you do have to take pictures in JPEG format, which are also fine for the repository, make sure to set the camera to the largest image size and the highest quality settings. Finally, it's important to get to know your equipment. Before leaving on a field trip, try some shots of the type you expect to collect on the trip. Take note of the settings that work best under different conditions and practice the whole process of getting images from the camera's memory card and sorting through them on your computer. As you do that, take note of which photographs worked well and which didn't so that you reproduce whatever worked best. Thank you for watching this video. For more about what to do with the images you've collected, take a look at our documentation at frogbear.org. Later videos will introduce techniques for specific situations like photographing books, documenting sites, and recording epigraphic inscriptions. Mm -hmm.